Welcome back to On Point with Ben and Am. Hello, Amadeep. Hey, Ben. How are you? Um, I'm really good, thank you. It's been a really, really good week so far. Um, how about yourself? Yeah, good for me as well, actually. I've got quite a lot done this week and I am ready for the end of the week, actually. Yeah, so good. I'm doing all right. We've got a very special guest today. Um, to be fair, I say that every week. Every every guest. <laughs> you do. Oh. Very lucky. I know. But, <laughs> exactly. But I still am. I know. No, well, this is it. I want to. Like, I, I I kind of feel like it's. Uh, I need to. Like this is a very very special guest. Like uh, this. Very, this is. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by Jonathan Rigby. Hi there, Jonathan. Hey. Hey, and um, I'm glad that I'm a special special guest. So uh, yeah. Good to well, have that. Special. It I sounds like they were... because you've been on before. You've been on my old podcast, so this is like well, you know you managed to come back again. So I have, but I can, <laughs> it, it, rather like grade inflation, I think if you use um, extra superlatives, then you're going to really sort of struggle, like to you know in a few weeks' time when you're introducing somebody else. So I, I don't want to take. Well, I, I like to set myself a challenge and set the bar quite high, and by, you know by bringing yourself on, we're obviously doing that, aren't we? So we always look to excel. <laughs> in um, in our business so it's it's a good thing so um so yeah as I, as I was saying Jonathan um came on uh, the insider podcast that I started during um during lockdown which was, which was a bit of a different pod it was focused more around technical leaders and kind of navigating the the landscape that we had at the time working remotely and hiring and looking after our staff um it's been I mean the time is flying like it's good year and a half since we would, we would have done that which is just pretty crazy to be honest with you but do you want to um get, obviously this is a bit of a different podcast with a slightly different audience would you like to kind of give everybody a bit of a kind of intro into who you are and where you are and what your background is yeah i'll try not to take too long because i've been around sort of software engineering for um i realized over 20 years uh and so if i go too far back then people will get lost a little bit and particularly if I start talking about technology from over 20 years ago because I when I give an introduction to people that I'm speaking to uh, candidates who are joining um, or potentially joining my company I give an introduction and I start by saying you know I once was a developer uh, uh, but a long long time ago and if I explain the technologies that I use you probably sort of never have heard of them because um, but Anyway, that is my background, uh, but I moved into, I suppose, a management and leadership role uh, about 12 years ago, and I've, I've looked after software engineering teams at various different companies, various different stages, various different sizes. So I feel like I've seen lots of different things. Um, it's great to be in software engineering leadership. I think it's a, uh, a cool place to sort of work. And I recently joined uh, a small startup, uh, a rapidly scaling startup. Uh, we've been going less than a year, uh, but we're already uh, over 60 people wow. um, and, over, and over 15 in engineering. So that's excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic success story. Um, you know, it started off, you know, in lockdown. Um, you know, the, the founder came up with an idea. Uh, got it out to market, um, showed that it was uh, doing really well. We raised a significant amount of funding uh, in 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 less than a year, um, and so it's we. Everybody likes to think of themselves as that unicorn, don't they? Uh, but we, I think, we are showing unicorn status at least uh, in this first year. And so, who knows what the the future holds? But it's it's certainly bright and positive. Yeah, and, and, and from my perspective, I'm I'm lucky enough to be to engage in and helping you guys scale, which is which is super exciting for us. I think that there's a lot of interesting startups that come around, and I think that initially when I speak to startups <clears throat> and understand a little bit about um, kind of what they're doing, that's that's one side of thing. But they have to be well backed. They have to be, you know, it's I think in technology, if you can work for a startup company. You, it, it's so engaging and the work that you especially when you're involved from the start the work you you're involved in has direct impact into how the company's growing which is so exciting about you but I also look at um the people who have gone and like you, you've gone from a big corporate business to a, so you know I sit, sit up and take you know and take notice of that it's like okay so I guess do you want to give a quick intro into who Kukita are and and, and what drew you to the company in the, in the first instance yeah sure um so we are um, a, a B2B uh, marketplace for buying from the wholesale. So uh, imagine you're a shop uh, and you're wanting to buy products. 
you previously used to have to ring up uh, wholesalers, suppliers, uh, maybe send off a fax, maybe send an Excel sheet across. Ah, brilliant. Uh, I know, I know. When Jonathan started in technology, I was... <laughs> well, ah, I haven't heard that word for a while. It's strange, isn't it? Because I think you get the sense that a lot of um, commerce has been disrupted by technology and that there's nothing left to, to do. But um, the founder, Yaniv, who came up with this idea, was, was looking to start his own e-commerce site and realised that there was a real... Um, gap in the market to try to actually find good suppliers of products and be able to compare. This is the key thing to be able to compare like you do on other marketplace sites, like you do on your Amazons, where you've got the same product and you've got different suppliers, different prices. Yeah. This didn't really exist in the wholesale market. And so we wanted to, well, he, he came up with this idea and, and really got it to market and, and, so far has proven that you know there is genuinely a, a need for this so you know where you can as if you're a, a shopper you're wanting to buy stuff you can try and find out the best price you can look and optimize uh, your shopping cart based on uh, the best price from all these different suppliers based on the quantity that you want to to receive so that's the essence of the business i have to confess though i'm 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 still learning all the time about the business. It's it's very new. It's it's not something I would naturally have some come across, uh, I suppose, in your normal walk of life. Uh, and I, and but it's suppo- really interesting. Yeah, and I suppose if it's that, like you said, it, they've kind of carved out a, a place in the market, and it's not not really anything there existing. So everyone's kind of learning at the same time, which is which is really good as well. Yeah, that brings its challenges because we're we're young, and we're as I said, we've got a lot of. Uh, new people in the organization and we're all trying to learn together but it it is that typical fast paced environment that you would imagine for a startup but, it, but it's, it's 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 exciting and like i say i think one whenever i look at startups or <coughs> startups come to me it's first of all who's involved and you know typically it would come through a recommendation you know exactly how how you and i would be working together but secondly you do look at the back in the funding and obviously you're talking about significant funding that the business has, has received which is going to obviously enable you to scale quickly but they've got some the, the, the guys funding have got some pretty successful stories from other tech startups that they've been involved in as well haven't they they are. I hope you're not going to ask me to, to sort of name everything. Well, I know, but I know well, that... as it's part of, my, part of my spiel. So if you need to, I'll, you can fall back on me. It's fine. <laughs> no, we have got we have got some key investors. And I think um, one of the headline, I suppose, is um, the, the investors that invested in Hopin. Um, they, they, they've they joined us. Um, and so we are backed. We, we, we are backed well and we're backed by some great investors. And so, and you asked me and I didn't answer the question previously, you know, what made you join, uh, you know, going from a company like Expedia to something like this? I suppose there was part of me that always wanted to scratch that startup pitch. I'd never really been involved in a startup. And so that was uh, appealing to me. And then it was trying to understand, well, you know, the business proposition and was there really, because, you know, it is that risk reward you know do you do you if you work for a startup you've got to try and go in with your eyes wide open and i was really convinced by uh, the founders i spoke to uh yaniv and danny uh, and they both were really passionate about what they believed in that's probably very commonplace but i think that there was some real substance behind it and in my sort of brief investigations into the market and understanding it i i, I found that there was so then it, 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 it said to me, well, OK, well, what is the opportunity for me? And the opportunity for me as head of engineering was to almost like build a, um, an engineering department from scratch and yeah, to amazing. be able to have that blank sheet of paper where I could maybe stamp my authority or, or, or some ideas that I had. As I said, <laughs> I've been around in software engineering for a long, long time. And I'd like to think over that period of time, I've, I've experienced lots of different things and I sort of know what works um or what, I, what i think works or, but what i would like to see in that ideal engineering environment and so it's great that i get the opportunity to do that now so excellent and i suppose oh no go on Emma, oh. go for it. i was gonna say i suppose with, with the experience that you've had and the length of experience you've got you come with a lot of um lessons learned, fires you've had to put out, um, fires you can now anticipate before you have to put them out. And I think that contributes a lot to a startup as well, doesn't it? To that startup culture. 
Is it, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> is it different, Jonathan, working with like, when you, when you work from a startup perspective, um, when you're working in a corporate environment and you're dealing with all the different divisions, um, and, I, and I'll probably pull this mainly towards towards products. I guess that's you know what you what you guys are. And I know that we've we've got some product positions with the business as well at the moment. And I think what's the, what's the difference between one of the biggest challenges with technology and Amadeeps, you know, comes across this quite frequently working delivery is the relationship between the product and the technical team. How how different is that in a startup? If, if you got, do you feel like you've got more control or? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately engineering and product, wherever you are, work really closely. You, you, they're, you, they're your key stakeholder. You, you know, I think the best, the best environments are where you're aligned in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so most places I've worked, I've, I've had that good relationship with the product team. I suppose what's different um, about somewhere established is that well, there's a lot more stakeholders. If I think back to the team that I was working with at Expedia, there was a lot of stakeholders who all wanted some piece of the pie in terms of what the engineering team was able to produce. We still got that, but it's at a, a smaller level uh, and it enables people to be able to probably sort of contribute and to, to steer the ship a little bit more and a little bit more quickly. Um, because also we're trying to learn our business as we go forward. We are... We're doing lots of things where we're trying to sort of test out whether what we're doing is is of value to customers. So we're trying to be very iterative. We were like that a little bit in the, in the larger enterprises, but it certainly gives you the opportunity to have an impact. Um, but you know, I, I think the relationship between product and tech is key wherever you are. Um, and you know, you I think you if you set yourself up well you can have a good influence uh, and those teams could work well together. But that's that's something that needs thought and it needs to be uh, proactive. Agreed. Agreed. And I think I've worked in some spaces as well where although it's assumed that product and tech work really closely together and they might even sit within the same division and they're not split out into their own separate divisions, they don't, which is quite unfortunate because I believe that one can't really work without the other. So, you know, you're, you're all needed in that in that ideal kind of team makeup. You need a bit of you need a bit of product delivery. You need a bit of engineering in order to make something really successful and um, iterate quickly as well. Mm, yeah. And a, a one key element I've seen um, in the mix of trying to make that relationship work well uh, is empathy. Um, and it, it might sound a strange thing to say because it might be, you know, that we've got to be aligned in terms of how much product work we're doing, how much tech debt we're doing, et cetera. But actually, the, the, the best uh, situation I've seen where product and tech have, have worked well together, where is where I've had a product manager advocating for, um, for doing tech debt and I've had an engineering leader advocating for doing these specific product features. And it's yeah. because they had that common empathy. And what I mean by that is engineers understanding the pressures, the challenges that the product team face, that it's all about trying to get things into delivery and making a difference to the product and the customer. And then the product team understanding the challenges that engineers face in terms of complexity of systems of being able to develop on you know, legacy code where tech debt arises, that type of thing. And understanding where they, they overlap allows people to be able to largely trust each other and therefore do what the right thing is, rather than it be a little bit of a battle saying, yeah. like, you know, we're, why are we doing all this tech debt? Because there's there's no real value to our customers there. We want to we want to add these features in. Um, so it's it's, 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 it's alerting. Yeah, I, I've never heard the word being uh, the word empathy being used in that one because but it's exactly correct I would use the word understanding I think once a, a hardcore engineer understands what a hardcore product or delivery person does um exactly that they then understand why we're doing tech debt and I've seen some absolutely smashing product owners and delivery managers that are like um here are all the points that we're going to take in, or this is the amount of work we're going to do in this next sprint or in this next time box. And actually this percentage is um, for bugs and this percentage is for technical debt. And they then take 
uh, what's completed, the work completed, and they're able to really nicely translate that. It creates its own metrics, which I know is something we were going to talk about. Because I think when the world shifted from um, projects managers to delivery managers, although the skill set is very, very, very similar, um, and one can be the other, I think what came with it was this element of being a lot closer to a project. So if I understand that my engineers are spending spending this whole spring on um, on technical debt, the product owner said it's all technical debt this spring, I can drive my metrics and my value probably through non-functional requirements. So it is actually, it ultimately all does go back to the customer in terms of value. It all goes back. So when when people are like technical, technical debt doesn't, um, there's no feature coming off the back of it. I'm like, yeah, but can they load the page faster? Are they are they are they getting stuck at the payment? But you know, are you ultimately and you know, it's a business. Are you ultimately looking at your bottom line profit and is it growing because of that? Well, well, there's your value right there. And and you know, some of the websites that I love using and the applications that I love using, if I see the the updates and it's bug fix bug fixes or um, loading time, I'm I'm happy because I'm now not sat waiting for a page to load, for example. So it's really important that empathy piece. I think it's it's very interesting. That's that's super. I love how you say it comes back to customer value because intrinsically that's what what grows the business. It's not about number of features. It's not about oh, can we do this thing sort of cleverly or in a in a in a way in which is you know using some sort of core cool technology for the sake of using it. You know, exactly. Does it, does it come back to customer value? And that's the ultimate. I mean, Ben, I know you sort of mentioned so sort the of metrics. That's the ultimate metric. I mean, we can mess around in between, but that's where you want to be really shifting the needle. Yeah, and I don't want 10 features on my application, which I can't use anywhere properly and as a as a consumer, as a customer. Um, I'd rather have two absolutely smashing features. And another one where people have um I've noticed that, you know. I think I would like to say I hope gone are the days where a delivery manager is batting someone over the head. How many points are you going to complete? How many points are you going to complete? I really hope that there's no organisations like we're still working like that. However, metrics are still important um, for lots of different reasons, and they can be a successful set of metrics implemented within technology and product and delivery. And um, one of the one of the key things for me is how you turn data into metrics. So yeah, mm-hmm. you can say that we have done a lot of work on technical debt of refactoring um, how our data sits in the warehouse, for example. And so now lots of teams can pull BI off it. That's really cool. But actually now uh, going back to customers and the value, a customer can ring up and say, hey, I want my um, chat history sent to me and instantly yeah. censor them. It's things like that, or it's, can you delete me? And they can, you know, they can go across the, through the GDPR route and you've got all the access to that. Or, hey, a payment went out on my credit card to this company and I don't remember making that. And you can quickly, you know, you can surface that information. So it's, it's really looking at not just that simple customer comes online, customer buys a product, customer goes up, pays for the product and goes away. It's all the other journeys that the customer also will, will um, encounter. Mm. I find really interesting with metrics as well. Yeah, and I think um, I, I think there's, there's so much there, isn't there? Um, I think the the, the data, we have to be careful about um, conflating data and metrics because you know we we have and, and it's, it's the it's a sort of double edged sword that we have so much data on customers. Um, you know, I think that it, it's what you then sort of do with that data. Yes, and, and it how is, you yeah. how you how you make it. Uh, useful and viable and and also making it sure that making sure that you've not got that sort of big brother style uh, approach to yeah. also your customers um but yeah on that on the certainly on the data side but on the metric side it's interesting you saying about um you're hinting at velocity and story points and, and, mm-hmm. and that type of thing because it's um i would say it's a little bit of a pet peeve for me in, in this whole space about how we use metrics in, in technology. And, and I bet your bottom dollar that there are people that use story points and management teams, sadly, judging the performance of software teams based, based on, on the amount of points that they based deliver. on the amount of exactly based on the story points. And um, 
I've seen it. I've been in organizations where that's happened. I've been in organizations where other metrics have been used. Um, I think maybe sometimes with good intentions, but the outcome of using those metrics are have a negative effect. So they not they're not trying to improve. So it not only do the the software teams feel like you know maybe this is something that was being used to to bash us over the head with but the software teams are generally pretty smart and they can they can yeah. circum- they can circum- they find ways around that look we yeah. can all- <laughs> you know what's really interesting i was once um asked to how can i um increase my velocity and i was so confused by the question and then i said do you know what story point is to the person who had asked me, who was bashing me over the head. And they said, well, yeah, it's how much work they can get done. I said, the reason engineers point things up is to give them an idea of what it might take in order to complete a task, not for time's sake, mm-hmm. but in order to like actually put, put their product into some sort of form of an engineering roadmap for themselves. Mm-hmm. And also to like pinpoint dependencies. So I can't complete that story until that story's done actually. So let's switch them around. Let's pop that into the backlog. And I said, not just that, but also that by teams wanting to do story points and, and engineers having that lovely um, space to, to point things up, they're actually learning themselves because it's amazing when you watch engineers and you do like a bit of a session with them when you start pointing things up. And, you know, I quite, I still use like planning poker because I think it's one of the, it's a really basic um, tool that my God highlights things in your team. So I'll say, okay, what do we think? Here's the story. It's all written up, blah, blah, blah. And I'll put it up, give them a bit of thinking time. And then they'll throw up their points. And it's really interesting when someone's got a seven or something and someone's got a two or a three. Mm-hmm. And that stimulates conversation and produces even better solutions because now the three pointer is telling you a solution. The seven pointer didn't even consider, and it's it 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 just makes it more so much more productive. But not when you're saying, well, why can't you do it in one point? Why can't you do it in half a day? Well, do you need to take your lunch break? Mm-hmm. And it's like so what? And then I find when you're in those kind of situations in terms of metrics and where that's happening in an organisation engineers they are intelligent intelligent individuals so they will inflate their estimates and if you've got a pretty good um sort of scrum master sat with them or a ba or whoever that product person is they'll let them inflate and they'll also know they're inflating because it becomes just a it becomes like a just a toxic cycle yeah i find that really interesting as well that people bash for points when it's something solely for them it is and and of course that was the reason it was brought in was it was a an internal tool for engine. Oh, you've, I think you've cut out there, John. Can you, Jonathan? You know, only for them. Oh. We lost, we just, we we lost, lost you for a second. We lost you for a second. That's all right. That one sentence we lost you on. Uh, let me start again. So it was started because of the value that it was internally for the team and for their engineers themselves. Yeah. Plan. It got then hijacked by managers, leaders who saw this as that there was that correlation between velocity and output or velocity and working hard, that there's some sort yeah. of, and, and, you know, and, and we, we just, we know that that's, and, and we know that the reason for doing that and to try to increase velocity is also a positive thing for the team. Mm-hmm. Because they can look at things like work in progress limits and, yeah. and optimize such that their natural velocity goes up. And that's a really positive thing to do. What's not positive is when those story points get taken up by leadership teams and say, why, have you, why team- is your velocity going down or why, why are you not improving your velocity? Because then what the team then says is I'm valued on this metric alone. Yeah. So my output is and and how I'm viewed and then play that into performance reviews, play that Everything. into promotions, et cetera, is, is on that. And we all know that there's a tension between delivery speed and quality, for example, yes. that's, that's the easiest one to, to look at. And so there's a, there's a, if you have that environment, there's a tendency thing for, for engineers to go, all right, let's try and increase our velocity. And we, you know what? The easiest way we'll do that, you talked about inflating estimates, that's one. Eh? But yeah. if, that, if, if that's 
if people can see that happening. The other way of doing it is cutting corners in terms of your process. And yeah. that involves making sure, well, not making sure that the tests all pass. And so releasing yeah. regardless. And then, of course, your quality drops. So yeah. there's, it's, it's a zero-sum game. You, you can't... Yeah, you can't it... Yeah, and it's really interesting. And, you know, the, the worst thing is when when you've got, like, lots and lots of teams working and there's, like, maybe one sort of person that maybe works across and maybe is it in, like, a program management position or something like that, and they're comparing points for teams and they're like, well, they've got one less person and they can produce more points. And, you know, those mature teams that are using, like, a Fibonacci... No, not a Fibonacci method, the other method. Um, is it the Fibonacci? You know, there's some teams that do it on a point is an ideal day. And um, some people use the actual Fibonacci method and it's not based on day. It's based on actual complexity of this of the issue. So those really mature teams could be could be churning out, you know, two, three hundred points in a normal team in a sprint. And if they're not using ideal days, whereas if you're using points as ideal days, it's set on days. So there's loads of different methods that teams choose to do as well. So it's, it's just not an easy comparison. One of the other... Um, things I always think about in terms of a metric, um, which I've had actually burn me and not burn me is the burn up and the burn down. So we show it. I've had teams that want it on the screen when they're sat in the office as part of their little pod and they love it. And I've had teams that are like, just, just don't show us. And actually what I found is those teams that are like, just don't show us it's because there's something fundamentally in the wrong. And we, we, we maybe drop and then we stagnate for most of the sprint. And it, it usually comes down to, poorly estimated stories inflated stories based on fear of getting a stick from someone so it's really interesting it's really just you know I always say if you if you if you deliver good work and if you work in engineering teams and you really work to make your environment the most productive it can be the metrics generate themselves I don't have to sit there and say I need x y and z because they just start generating themselves and actually the team never need to hear the word metric that's how I, I like to look at it. Yeah, and the other way of, of, of I've seen it work well is that the team themselves define what are the metrics they want to work on rather than yeah. it come top-down. Bottom-up approach is always good, whether you're talking about uh, metrics or... Because, again, it ultimately, the, the burn-down chart that you reference, is, it's for the team's benefit, for nobody All else's benefit. You know, the, nobody else should be sticking their nose in and checking out well, why is your burn down chart not a yeah. perfect and I I always used to have questions if I saw a perfect burn down chart that was yeah. like that and know? I'm like why is your team perfect it's like put them in a textbook <laughs> and teach the rest of us because like you said most of mine would stagnate for a while and we'd have to look at the ways we're working and what's really interesting is I think when this all started happening and teams started um, self-organizing and, and and taking all these little tools into account and really working that way. And I have had the pleasure of working in an environment like that. Uh, when I used to work for Sky quite a while back, we did, you know, we really, it was a really glorious period. Whilst, whilst technology was figuring all of that out, I don't think anyone else in the wider business was thinking, okay, everybody does get measured on performance in some sort of way. What do we do? I know what we'll do. We'll take how they measure themselves and we'll turn it into an awful metric that now people are scared of and they don't want to tell you what points the, the story is. And they took it and they made it toxic, which was really... They didn't do that at Sky, but I feel like a lot of organisations have done that, which is a real shame. I also, because I work... So I, I, I'm, I'm a technical delivery manager or product, whatever, sort of, whatever fits I go into the role. So because I've done some engineering myself. But... Um, what I found not bad, is, not bad at recruitment either, by the way. You know, she can bad at recruitment. You know, I that as well. I've, I've done recruitment as well. I have done it all. Um, way back when, though, a long time ago. <laughs> but um, what I found with with teams is, if you equip with, equip them with the right amount of tools, they will become themselves productive very, very quickly, and they will tell you where their problems are. And I think if we continue to drive value and measure value of teams based on customer success and customer happiness, uh, for want of a better word, I think you'll get some, you'll get your metrics there and then. Instead of saying get, get fifteen features out in the next few months. Yeah, and it's interesting because the, the way I lead, what are the ways in which I try to explain it to myself is that um because i've been in organizations where 
the idea is to set some OKRs for the team. And so we might yeah. look at, um, well, it might not be sort of delivery rate. We might not look at velocity, but we might look at uh, other um, typical engineering metrics. So um, yeah. downtime or, or things like that, or, or bug count or, um, uh, you know, amount of time, cycle time is a classic one, isn't it? Getting yeah. it from start to finish. Again, all good metrics. Um, but what I've said to my team is that's great, but I, and I could focus on two or three of those for the next six months, so we could all work on those. The challenge I have with doing that is if I think about my software team, I want them to do about 20 different things well, not just two or three things well. So, you know, I often say, well, OK, well, I want my teams to be innovative. I want them to write clean code. I want them to be uh, deliver quickly into production. I want them to mentor each other. I want them to learn and develop themselves. I start going down this road and I say, well, do I have a metric for all of those? Well, that's going to get pretty complex pretty quickly. Yeah. And so what I try and do is I try and trust my team to do all those things by saying, you know, this is the type of things that is, is expected of a, you know, top quality engineering team. So that's the danger with, with metrics. And you, uh, I'm saying, you just, I'm not saying you shouldn't use them. Yeah. Um, I think you just go in with your eyes wide open. And, and for the right ones for the right environment as well. Right. If you're going to implement a system where you're, you're measuring a team uh, based on metrics, go in with your eyes wide open. Think about the, how it might be interpreted, think about the potential downfalls. I think if you do that, then you're on the right track. Um, but I use them sparingly, I have to say, with my team. Yeah, no, fair. You've got you, but you also just mentioned a really key word in that whole sentence, which um would I would love it if all leaders did it, but you said trust. I trust my team is how you started that sentence. So that in itself removes so many barriers so many things from engineering teams where they can they can fail fast they can learn quickly they can help each other they can pair program they can xp they can do whatever they need to do in order to get to the best solution and deliver that best solution but there is unfortunately you know a lot of organizations that I still don't fully trust and i think going back to what you originally said where you wanted to be in sort of a startup call you wanted to um satisfy the startup itch i think it's good for someone in your position where there, there is a, a, le a big level of trust to, to start up an organization with that because it bleeds out it just as much as people don't want to believe it, it does leadership bleeds out into how other um, people behave and how they then begin leading other people because of course you'll have people that work for you and and whoever however tall or flat the hierarchy is you know you'll have levels of leadership and they will look at you and think well that's how Jonathan does it and it works so I'll, I'll do it too but you know with that well this is well this happens when you when, you know started from scratch isn't it this is that was what you said at the beginning this is what this that's that itch was to come in and start something from scratch you can set all your own principles like knowing Jonathan obviously as I do through previous pods and um and listening some talks and uh, and obviously recruiting for him the other key thing you said was obviously um um downward down um, growing a team from down to up in terms of them obviously having the responsibility and that comes down to the whole again it's all it, this is why if, if you're working for a startup business now this is they're going to go because they want to have that responsibility and that trust to help drive a business forward right so and this is obviously the the, the metrics is key so i know that you've, you've, you've got a talk coming up soon around this is that right yeah that's probably why i'm it's on my mind and i'm talking about it and it, it's that my focus because um, I partly got to prepare for a talk on it. Yeah, but, but the thing is, I've, yeah, but I'm generally, guys, I've, I've kind of sat here pretty quiet, right? And but I've learned, I've learned a lot from this. But this is really interesting um, from my perspective. And I think this is like it's, it's again, it's another for me good um, understanding of of the culture that you're creating down at Kogita and, and and obviously what you're trying to um, kind of achieve moving forward. So. I guess that's probably not a bad time to, to take on to that, really. I mean, what's you've obviously got a lot of work on. There's a lot of um, big, it's a big challenge you've undertaken. You're obviously growing at the moment. What's the what's where are we now? We, we are in February, aren't we? What's the what's the plans for the business and, and your engineering team? Have you got like a kind of roadmap over through 2022? Or yeah, I mean, we've got um, high hopes and 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 ambitious uh, designs for the future. 
if I look at engineering team, um, it's primarily about growth. Um, you know, we need to uh, grow our team, grow our business, understand what our customers need. Uh, and so it's it's about scaling that team uh, as sustainably, but but as quickly as we can. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and you're, yes, <laughs> you, you are Ben, and I'm Thank very you. grateful. Um, <laughs> So that's and, and we know that it's a it's a competitive environment. But I think, you know, what I've said to people who've spoken to me about opportunities at the Kagita, I think, is that we've got that like I've got a blank page. They've got a blank page to come in and to really influence at the beginning of uh, the growth of an engineering department. I think with that sort of growth, obviously comes the opportunity, um, career opportunities that many people look out for you know how do i grow my career well that sort of level of growth uh you know i think we want to double again our size by the summer so we're at 15 we want to be 30 at the beginning of summer that naturally will give opportunities for, for growth for people who are joining us at this point but it's not only that it's it's the ability to influence how you want an engineering team to work yeah. i'm a strong believer of um I, I borrow it very heavily from um, a, a somebody that everyone's familiar with, Dan Pink, who talks about how we engage and we're motivated in what we do. And that's by autonomy, mastery and purpose. Exactly. Um, and so that one of those key elements for me in that is that autonomy piece. So if I can give my teams who are smart individuals the ability to work out what is the best thing again for the customers um, then I want to give them the latitude to be able to go with that I want them to try things out it doesn't matter if they fail because the idea is this is a an environment where you know we want people to do that we're a startup we want people to try things out to do innovative things to be creative um, because we think that that's we think that's the right way to do it it's not a, I also feel it makes great business sense too. So it's 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 not just an ethical perspective. I've seen in the 20 years I've been in software engineering and the 12 plus years I've been in engineering leadership, that that is the way to get success is to create that environment where you have autonomy, where you're able to get better, where you have that mastery, and that you really understand the purpose behind what we're doing. Yeah. So we work very closely with the, the product team to basically say, to be involved in it. We have cross-functional teams. So we have everybody and they involved in the problem solving right from the beginning, right from ideation, yeah. right the way through to delivery. So it's not a situation, which is where I started my engineering, where a business analyst or a product manager would write a specification and then hand it out, including Head. a button would be here that, you know, do a drop down here, do this. <laughs> yeah. And then you would just be a code monkey. You would just be there to write the code. And then you threw it over the fence to the QA team yeah. to test it for quality. Now, we're not about that. We're wanting mm. people to be involved in the whole thing, solving the customer problems from the beginning. Because, firstly, I think that's the most engaging, motivating way to work. I think people really want to be part of coming up with the solution rather than just going through writing out the code. But also, I think it, it's helpful because engineers know what's possible so when you have that situation okay we, we're wanting to do this for the customer well the engineers are saying well i know this technology or this open source piece of work where we could do it in that way and yeah. I think that will be a positive so for so many reasons i think that level of setting out that framework and letting people go is is the best way excellent i mean yeah it's it, it's very very exciting one thing else talking about <clears throat> trying new things and uh and, and being open i know that the one thing that stood out for me when i when i initially uh, engaged with the business is uh it's about the benefits right so you know i've read the netflix um book you know it's coming here jonathan because mm -hmm. i still find it fascinating because you are still the only company that I have. I know there's a few that do this, but it's the first company that that, that I've been involved in. And to be fair, we, you know, we're quite particular. We're very partnership. We're very, you know, we want to work with, with businesses at scale. So you know, I'm not an agency with a massive um, team. We, we're very small and focused. 
But Amity, how would you feel about have, about our business having um, an unlimited holidays policy? You know me, I'm super, super liberal. I'm really all for it. I think ultimately you need to trust your employees. I think, and you need to, you can only help create autonomous teams if you provide them an equipment with tools. And one of the tool, the biggest tools you can provide a team with is trust. Yeah. And you will have a few slip ups and people might not know how to uh, use it. They might not have to know how to use your trust. And it's, 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 it's a journey, isn't it? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with unlimited holidays. I don't think there's anything wrong with unlimited mat leave, pat leave, all these types of things. I think it's, if you've not kind of got it. Well, my point is, it's, it's, it's yeah, and sorry to bring Jonathan back in, it's something that is, um, yeah, as a startup, you can, you can just imagine, you know, big corporates suddenly turn, flicking the switch and say, right, unlimited holidays, so you'd have carnage, but you can create the right culture from the startup business, I guess. Um, this is something that's, that's true. That's yeah. really interesting for me, Jonathan. Now, how's how's it all going? Have you have you just been on holiday for the last two months? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. But then this time of year in in the UK yeah. is it's not very conducive to having um, mm. particularly long holidays. But the plan is definitely later in the year to take take some good time with the family. I think the way and we. Amadi, you, you said it earlier on about the, the trust element. Ben, you just reiterated it. It does come down to that. And it's, it's, I think it's a, a, a great two-way street. And one thing that I've, I've been really impressed in, um, you know, we're a small engineering team, but we, 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 we believe in what we're doing and that trust goes both ways. So inevitably at a startup, you're going to have lots of growing pains. You're going to have incidents. You're going to have out-of-hours issues. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the team in terms of how well they collaborate and jump on things like issues that come up. And I think partly that's down to, um, well, it's, it's the character of the people that we hire, but partly it's also down to that where we're trying to create that right environment, because we know like if there's something going on in the, in somebody's family life that they need to take some time, then great go yeah. take the time because that's really important and when the business needs you uh there's there's a fire that needs to be put out they're on it too and it's just I like it's a healthy relationship isn't it it becomes a healthy it is and i think it's an obvious relationship but i and and so almost in some senses doesn't need to be said i think good people recognize that and 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 see that but it's got it has to be that that, yeah. that both sides thing yeah. yeah, I just I just think over the last couple of years, what we've gone through with COVID, I think that, you know, work-life balance and, uh, and remote working and everything else has become such a big thing. So if you're a startup business, like our business, like your business, you know, why not look at these um, these different things and, and, and make sure that anybody who's coming in, because a lot of people, obviously I work in recruitment, a lot of people are moving and interested in, in, in the new opportunities of Kikita is because of, this, everything we just spoke about in the last yeah. five minutes, you know, the trust, uh, the, the, the flexibility to work from home, etc. So, yeah, it's listen, it's all very, very exciting. But we could we could talk for hours, to be honest with you, Jonathan. I'm going to let you crack on because I know you're a very, very busy guy. But thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. No, it's nice. Thank it's lovely man. just to, to chew the cud on on various sort of engineering topics. It's uh, it's a good opportunity. So I appreciate the platform. Yeah, well, we're going to have. Um, Hopefully events is going to be the next thing for us. Now we're slowly but surely coming, coming back out. And I think that, you know, we'd love you to come along and to, and to get involved in the, in the kind of technical leadership community that we have and hopefully get involved in some of the talks. There's lots of different things that um, we will be covering and uh, making the most of all of your 20 years experience. <laughs> you won't be asking about COBOL or anything like that. So don't worry. Old COVID no, it's not like. far off that though. <laughs> Fair enough. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on. Look forward thank to speaking you. to you soon. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.